Hello everyone, welcome back. And today I want to talk about Narcissistic Personality Disorder, or NPD. So, Narcissistic Personality Disorder is something that I've discussed here on the channel before when I did a video briefly going over the disorder as a whole. But today I wanted to look into some of the research and show you a paper written by people in the personality psychopathology field that I follow as someone who's interested in personality psychopathology as an area of graduate study. So I wanted to kind of run you through some of the aspects of narcissistic personality disorder that are kind of lesser known. And if people knew these things, it might give them a better understanding of what it means for someone to maybe have narcissistic personality disorder or for someone to be a narcissist and why they are the way they are and kind of maybe what's going on in their head a little bit. So let's get into it. One of the reasons I wanted to make this video is because I have a bit of an issue with how the word narcissist is used today. You know, if you go to YouTube, if you watch, you know, TV, anything, you'll hear the word narcissist used to describe just about anyone who occasionally shows selfish traits. You know, if you're selfish one or two times, you get labeled as a narcissist. Or even if you have a really kind of high self-esteem or you're egocentric, you'll see these people being called narcissists. And I feel like this is actually damaging to our understanding of psychopathologies and narcissism in particular. And I think it's important as a society to understand what it means for someone to be a narcissist so we can properly identify, you know, the problems that person might be facing, how we can better interact with them, if there's any way that we can even treat these people. I don't think it's right to dehumanize people even if they have disorders that may be antagonistic towards others. So if someone is a menace to society or they're a problem or they're having interpersonal struggles, that doesn't mean that we should dehumanize them to the point that they are no longer allowed to kind of try to become better or try to become better people and integrate back into society. So that's really the, the jumping point for this is I think that there is an issue with the, the common usage of the word narcissist. Let's briefly go over the basic diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. I'm not going to go over all of it. You can go check out my older video if you want to see the overview on NPD as a whole. So what it means to have NPD according to the DSM is a pervasive pattern of grandiosity and fantasy or behavior, a need for admiration, lack of empathy, beginning by a early adulthood and presenting in a variety of contexts, as indicated by five or more of the following. And then you can see here the list of potential diagnostic traits that can be associated with narcissistic personality disorder. So essentially, you're looking at someone who has that kind of sense of grandiosity, you know, they have a very uh, high sense of entitlement, they believe that they deserve things, even if maybe they don't, they kind of see themselves as higher than other people. There's a focus on the self when it comes to narcissistic personality disorder. The paper that we're going to be looking at today that discusses the scientific you know, background and structure of narcissistic personality disorder is called Narcissism Today, What We Know and What We Need to Learn. So essentially, this paper really breaks down what narcissism is at the scientific and empirical level. And it does that by looking at the factors that make up narcissistic personality disorder or narcissism in general. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you look at a personality disorder or a psychopathology or anything, you know, mental health related, you're going to see that there are smaller traits or subversions that can make up these larger versions. So our understanding of the things that make up the whole allow us to better understand the whole. And with narcissistic personality disorder or narcissism, we originally started by just calling it narcissism. This is what's called a one-factor model. We just said, okay, we have narcissism. But eventually, as research continued, there became a two-factor model, and narcissism was divided into grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. Grandiose narcissism is essentially the type of narcissist who thinks very highly of themselves, or maybe they're someone who desires attention. They're someone who's going to feel like they are, you know, a little more entitled than the other people, or maybe even better than other people. There's a sense of superiority associated with grandiose narcissism. Where the vulnerable narcissist is someone who kind of on the other side maybe has a more fragile sense of ego. They're going to be someone more defensive about their sense of self, their personality, their ego in general. And they're going to be someone who maybe kind of pushes back against uh, claims against them or themselves. They, they want to be seen as higher as well, but for the vulnerable narcissist, it's more so a defensive approach to their ego, while the grandiose narcissist is someone who has kind of more of an offensive approach to how they're going to be presenting themselves and, you know, defending their ego. The breakdown of narcissism doesn't end there, though. Under the 
two-factor model, we can actually see that these two factors are then divided into three more factors. So under grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism, we have agentic extroversion, antagonism, and narcissistic neuroticism. So agentic extroversion is kind of a weird one because this isn't necessarily a negative trait. And as you can see by the diagram here, it's primarily or actually only correlated or associated with grandiose narcissism as opposed to vulnerable narcissism. So agentic extroversion is built up of the foundational traits of gregariousness, assertiveness, and excitement seeking. So the grandiose narcissist is someone who may have a slightly easier time integrating into society compared to the vulnerable narcissist because they will also sometimes portray traits that aren't necessarily negative in nature, while assertiveness, for example, can be seen as a negative trait if it's taken too far. It can also be something that's seen as a positive trait in that you occasionally want like leaders who are assertive, for example. So the grandiose narcissist might have a slightly easier time uh, getting into society or interacting with others because of their agentic extroversion subcomponent. Now, both grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism share the trait of antagonism. So antagonism is going to be essentially negative agreeableness when we're talking about the five-factor model. So trust, straightforwardness, altruism, modesty, tender-mindedness. Antagonism, pretty straightforward, just means that you're not going to be able to easily kind of get along with this person. They're going to be antagonistic to the social environment or others within it. So that's the thing that causes problems when it's combined with agentic extroversion. So if you have something like assertiveness, for example, but then you combine assertiveness with antagonism, then you get the issue of someone being more closely related to being a grandiose narcissist. The final trait is going to be narcissistic neuroticism, and this is going to be related to vulnerable narcissism, but not grandiose narcissism. So narcissistic neuroticism is going to be associated with the big five trait of surprise, Neuroticism. So anger, self-consciousness, vulnerability, general emotional reactivity. The vulnerable narcissist is going to be a little bit more emotionally unstable compared to the grandiose narcissist. And as you might be able to guess, if you combine that narcissistic neuroticism with antagonism, that's when you kind of get this really difficult mix of negative personality traits that's going to make it hard for these people to integrate into social settings at all. It's very difficult for the vulnerable narcissist because they do have this high sense of neuroticism, you know, emotional reactivity combined with their antagonism. Another thing that this paper discusses that is important is that high self-esteem and narcissism are not the same thing. So you might see someone who has a really, really high self-esteem, maybe verging onto that point of, egoism and you'll think okay maybe that person's narcissistic when if you look at the you know the empirical backing here there's really no backing to those claims you're not going to see that high self-esteem and narcissism are you know correlated to such a degree that they are the same thing there is a relationship between specifically grandiose narcissism and high self-esteem but it's only about 0.28 which is a positive relationship there's something there it is notable but it's not something big enough to say that they're practically the same construct what is specifically interesting is that if you break down high self-esteem and narcissism, you'll see that the sub-traits that they are correlated to are going to differ. So essentially, self-esteem as a construct is correlated positively with adaptive traits and negatively correlated with maladaptive ones, meaning that people who have high self-esteem on its own are going to have traits that make it easier for them as a person, and they're going to have less of traits that make it difficult for them as a person to kind of interact socially or function as a human. Whereas if you look at the traits of narcissism specifically, the ones that they correlate to, you're going to see that it is primarily correlated positively with maladaptive traits. So that means that the more narcissistic you are, the more narcissism you have, the harder it is for you to adapt to the situations you're in or kind of integrate socially or functionally into the world. So to me, this is really quite interesting because it shows that there is some overlap between high self-esteem and specifically grandiose narcissism, but at the at the kind of sub-trait or sub-component level, the things that are being related between them are differing in their functionality and outcomes because you can be someone who has a high self-esteem on its own and have very positive or adaptive traits 
Or you can be someone who is narcissistic, has high narcissism, and maybe a little bit of a high self-esteem as well, but have more negative outcomes because you are correlating more so with the negative components there. One of the biggest problems when it comes to how narcissism is understood at the kind of societal level is that a lot of people, these kind of gurus on YouTube who teach narcissism, even people who are like medical professionals kind of dive into this as well because they know it's going to get them views, these sorts of things. They talk about the idea that narcissists all have this kind of vulnerable state inside of them. This is known as the mask model of narcissism, essentially that they wear these big grandiose masks to hide their vulnerability on the inside. And while this is going to be somewhat true when you look at the vulnerable narcissist, the type that is going to be more vulnerable in nature, you know, by their very nature, that's going to be true to some extent. But when you look at the grandiose narcissist, there's actually not much evidence to support this idea that every grandiose narcissist has this kind of deep state within them that's actually really vulnerable that they're trying to defend. And in fact, you might find that the grandiose narcissist doesn't even have the potential of being negative about themselves in their mind. The way that I like to think about this is that, you know, think of the story of Narcissus. You know, this is someone who essentially fell in love with himself to the point where it, you know, practically kills him. It's going to be the point where he turns down everyone around him. He's so rejective of the opinions of others that he just says, okay, whatever, no one's opinions about me matter other than me. And then I like myself so much that I'm going to fall in love with myself. There's no deep stated vulnerability or anxiety about the self in this type of individual. Instead, it's someone who's kind of on the opposite end of that spectrum where they're saying, okay, I'm so great. Look at me. Look how great I am. And, you know, it doesn't always have that that vulnerableness underneath some sort of mask. And this is something that research tends to support when it comes to the grandiose narcissist. There's also no evidence to support the idea that ex high explicit self-esteem is going to be something that co-occurs with low implicit self-esteem, meaning that someone who has self high self-esteem is going to kind of switch back and forth between high self-esteem and low self-esteem, which is what you would assume if you were working with someone who has grandiose narcissism, who does have that kind of mask model working for them. You would expect them to kind of have these variations in states between high self-esteem and low self-esteem, and that's really what, not what is seen when you look at the, the empirical data surrounding narcissism. So this leaves the question in the air of what motivates the person with narcissistic personality disorder or the narcissist in general to act the way they do? What motivates them to think the way they do and why are they essentially being narcissistic? The paper gives potential insight into what these could be. So initial evidence points to distinct associations of neurotic narcissism to shame, of antagonistic narcissism to hubristic pride and malicious envy, and of agentic narcissism to benign envy. So let's briefly go over those three so you can get an understanding of what that really means. So neurotic narcissism is going to be the one most associated with vulnerable narcissism. So that means that people with vulnerable narcissism are most likely to be motivated by shame in themselves, whereas antagonistic narcissism, which is going to be that trait that is shared between the vulnerable narcissist and the grandiose narcissist. So antagonistic narcissism is going to be associated with hubristic pride and malicious envy. So essentially pride, you know, feeling high about oneself and then malicious envy. So malicious envy is the type of envy that is associated with you believing that someone else does not deserve something that they have and that instead you should be the one to have that. What I think is really interesting though is that the, the third trait here, agentic narcissism is associated to benign envy. So benign envy is the type of envy we have when we believe that someone else does deserve something. So if you see someone who worked really hard for something and you believe that they worked hard for it, but you're also kind of envious that they have it, this is known as benign envy. So benign envy is typically what motivates a person to do something themselves to attempt to kind of work harder to get the thing that they want. So benign envy is going to be a trait associated with grandiose narcissism. So that's why in general, you might find that the grandiose narcissism or the grandiose narcissist is slightly more likely to succeed and integrate into society a little bit better because they might not only see 
others as having things that they want or uh, being in competition with others, but they're also going to see that they might themselves need to work harder or push themselves to higher limits to get the things that they want. Now, if this was a trait that was on its own by itself, it would be something that's a generally positive trait, but because it's also going to be associated with that uh, shared trait of antagonistic narcissism, that's where you're going to kind of see the, the poison in the water there, where you're going to see the combination of benign envy with malicious envy, or you might even see them switching between these states when they're thinking about oh, who deserves what and how they should go about getting these things. So that's really the kind of summary of what motivates the narcissist.